Here is the beast known as Ahmed's integral. And surprisingly, the solution development using Feynman's technique is quite elegant, and the result is pretty satisfying too. So without further delay, let's call our integral i, and let's define our integral function i of some parameter t as the integral from 0 to 1 of the inverse tangent of t times the square root of x squared plus 2 divided by 1 plus x squared times the square root of x squared plus 2 dx. So we've introduced the parameter t as part of the argument of the inverse tangent function. Now, in order to successfully evaluate an integral using Feynman's technique, we need some information about the behavior of the function. And in this case, given the structure of our integral function, the structure is actually quite convenient for extracting some information about its behavior that will come in handy later. And the reason for me saying that the structure is quite convenient is because of the inverse tangent function up in the numerator. Because in the limit as t goes to infinity, this inverse tangent function goes to pi by 2. So that means the limit of i of t as t goes to infinity is pi by 2 times the integral from 0 to 1 of dx divided by 1 plus x squared times the square root of x squared plus 2. Now this integral is quite easy to evaluate using simple trig substitutions. So if we let x equal the tangent of u, which implies that dx equals the square of the secant of u du, it implies that this limit that I'm going to write as i of infinity which I admit is pretty bad notation, but it's convenient for now. So this equals pi by 2 times the integral from... Now as x approaches 0, uh, for x to approach 0, u should approach 0 as well. And for x to approach 1, uh, the u variable should approach pi by 4. And in the numerator, you get the square of the secant of u, du term, divided by... 1 plus x squared is just 1 plus the square of the tangent of u, which is the square of the secant of u. So you have this term downstairs times the square root of x squared plus 2 is just x squared plus 1 plus 1, right? And x squared plus 1 is just this square of the secant of u. So you have this uh, square root of the square of the secant of u plus 1. And you have some nice cancellations going on. And you have pi by 2 times the integral from 0 to pi by 4 of du divided by... Now, you can write this as the reciprocal of the square of the uh, square of the cosine of u. And this has the utility of transforming your denominator into the square root of 1 plus the square of the cosine of u divided by the cosine of the uh, square of the cosine of u all in the square root. So if you multiply upstairs and downstairs by the cosine of u, you get pi by 2 times the integral from 0 to pi by 4 of the cosine of u du divided by 1 plus the square of the cosine of u, of the square root of it, that is. And since we know that the square of the cosine can be written as 1 minus the square of the sine, we can write i of infinity as pi by 2 times the integral from 0 to pi by 4 of the cosine of u du divided by 1 plus 1, 2 minus the square of the sine of u. And the reason I used this uh, trigonometric formula here is because I have this cosine of u du term in the numerator, which makes another substitution very convenient. If I let the uh, sine of u equal phi, this will imply that the cosine of u du equals d phi. And this implies that i of infinity equals pi by 2 times the integral from 0 to... Now as u approaches pi by 4, phi will approach 1 by the square root of 2. So you have this d phi term in the numerator divided by the square root of 2 minus 
phi squared, which evaluates to an inverse sine function. So you have pi by 2 times the inverse sine of phi divided by the square root of 2, with the limits being 0 and 1 by the square root of 2. Now, as phi approaches 0, the inverse sine approaches 0 as well. And as phi approaches 1 by the square root of 2, you get the inverse sine of 1 by 2, which is pi by 6, correct? So you get pi by 2 times pi by 6, and this equals pi squared by 12. And here is the information about the function, the integral function, that you'll need later. So we've defined our integral function i of t, we have some information about it, and we're interested in the case where the parameter t equals 1. So now we can take the derivative of i with respect to t. And because the inverse tangent function is bounded between negative and positive pi by 2, and the functions in the denominator provide no concerns regarding convergence or boundedness either, so it is safe to switch up the order of the integration and the differentiation operators. So you now have the integral from 0 to 1, and once you perform the switch up, the total derivative with respect to t becomes a partial derivative. So you're differentiating partially with respect to t, the inverse tangent of t times the square root of x squared plus 2 divided by x squared plus 1 times the square root of x squared plus 2 dx. Because you're differentiating partially with respect to t, all these x terms in the denominator are just constants. So you now have the integral from 0 to 1 of uh, 1 by x squared plus 1 times the square root of x squared plus 2 times uh, now the derivative of this inverse tangent func function sorts out to 1 plus t squared times x squared plus 2. And by the chain rule, you have this uh, constant multiple of x squared plus 2, the square root of x squared plus 2, and the derivative of t with respect to t is 1 anyway. Okay, so this cancels out this pesky square root of x, plus, x squared plus 2 term, and you're left with the integral from 0 to 1 of dx divided by x squared plus 1 times uh, multiplying out, you have x squared times t squared plus 2t squared plus 1. And now we need a partial fraction decomposition for the integrand. Now because you don't have a mixture of quadratic and linear terms, and both the terms in the denominator are just quadratic terms, you have a very simple partial fraction decomposition. You have a by x squared plus 1 plus b by x squared times t squared plus 2 t squared plus 1, which implies that oh, you don't have this dx term over there. Sorry about that. So you have uh, 1 equal to a times x squared t squared plus 2 t squared plus 1 plus b times x squared plus 1. So if we let x squared be equal to negative 1, this will imply the 1 equals a times negative t squared plus 2t squared plus 1 plus b times 0, correct? So this implies that a equals 1 by 1 plus t squared. And now I'm going to rewrite uh, this equation up here knowing that I have this value of a, and I'm going to use an arbitrary value of x to figure out the value of b. So we, so we have 1 equal to 1 plus t squared times all of this stuff here, plus 1 plus b times x squared plus 1. And the arbitrary value, quite conveniently, we're going to use is x equal to 0. So if x equals to 0, you have 1 equal to, I'm just going to write it up here, uh, this term goes to 0, and this is just b. Okay, cool. This is 2t squared plus 1, and this, equal, this implies that b equals um, 1 minus t 
2t squared plus 1 divided by 1 plus t squared, which equals 1 plus t squared minus 2t squared minus 1 over 1 plus t squared, which gives us finally negative t squared divided by 1 plus t squared being equal to b, and that completes the ingredients for our partial fraction decomposition. Now, thanks to the partial fraction decomposition, we have a couple of really nice integrals we can evaluate. Now, because we're integrating uh, in the x world, the t's are just constants. So we have 1 by 1 plus t squared times the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 by 1 plus x squared, <coughs> which evaluates to an inverse tangent. And with these limits, you get a pi by 4, correct? minus t squared divided by 1 plus t squared times the integral from 0 to 1. Now I'm just going to multiply upstairs and downstairs by 1 by t squared. And that has the benefit of simplifying the denominator. I now have x squared plus 2 plus 1 by t squared. And I can simplify, I can write the constant terms in a more compact form as 2t squared plus 1 divided by t squared, and the t squared terms here cancel out. So finally you have pi by 4 times 1 by 1 by t, 1 plus t squared minus 1 by 1 plus t squared, and here you have another inverse tangent. So you have this, uh, the reciprocal of your constant term, uh, the square root of it anyway. So you have t by the square root of 2t squared plus 1 times the inverse tangent of x times, again, this constant term square root. So you have all of this, and the limits of integration are 0 and 1. And once again, in the limit as x goes to 0, everything vanishes, and as x goes, and as x approaches 1, you have this stuff here. So finally, you have an expression for the derivative of i with respect to t completely in terms of the parameter t. And we now wish to recover back the function i of t. And viewers of the channel know that I like to use definite integrals at this stage. So we're integrating with respect to t from where to where exactly? Well, we we're interested in the case where t equals 1, and we know the behavior of the function in the limit as t goes to infinity. So we're going to integrate from 1 to infinity with respect to t. So you have another inverse tangent structure here, which evaluates to this constant of pi by 4 times in the limit as t goes to infinity, you get pi by 2, and in the limit as t goes to 1, you get pi by 4. Now pi by 2 minus pi by 4 is just pi by 4 again, and pi by 4 squared is just uh, pi squared by 16, minus the integral from 1 to infinity of t by 1 plus t squared times the square root of 2t squared plus 1 times the inverse tangent of t by 2t squared plus 1, the square root of that, that is integration with respect to t. And you must be thinking, oh, wait a second, this integral looks worse than the integral we started with. Well, uh, there's nothing to be afraid of here. Uh, let's call the integral i sub 1, and this integral simplifies quite nicely using a transformation from the t world to the 1 by t world. So under this transformation, i sub 1 becomes the integral from 1 to 0 of 1 by t divided by, now this term here is 1 plus 1, plus 1 by t squared, so uh, t squared plus 1 divided by t squared definitely and square root 2 by t squared. So 2 plus t squared by t squared, right? So I'm just going to write this as the square root of 2 plus t squared divided by t times the inverse tangent of a lot of stuff. That is 1 by t divided by, again, t squared plus 2, uh, the, square root, the square root of that divided by t, integration with respect to t, and the differential element transforms into a negative 1 by t squared dt term. Okay, cool. And you have some really nice cancellations going on here. Uh, there you go. 
Okay, that was quite nice. So you now have the integral from... You can switch up the limits of integration and get rid of this pesky negative sign as well. So you have the integral from 0 to 1 of the inverse tangent of 1 by the square root of t squared plus 2 divided by t squared plus 1 times the square root of t squared plus 2 dt. And this looks quite familiar to Ahmed's integral, the integral we started with. The only difference is that that did not have the, recip the uh, inverse tangent of the reciprocal of 1 by the square root of t squared plus 1. And just had the inverse tangent of the square root of t squared plus 1. However, using some basic trigonometry, we know that the inverse tangent of 1 by this term plus the inverse tangent of the reciprocal of this term equals pi by 2. So this implies that I sub 1 equals the integral, the integral from 0 to 1 of um, pi by 2 minus this inverse tangent term divided by all of that junk in the denominator that I'm tired of reading out loud but I keep doing that because my handwriting is pretty atrocious so I keep saying all the stuff out loud so that you can follow me as I'm solving integrals or differential equations and stuff like that so separate, separating out the terms in the integrand, you get pi by 2 times the integral from 0 to 1 of dt divided by t squared plus 1 times the square root of t squared plus 2. And you will recognize this as the limit of i of t as t goes to infinity minus the integral from 0 to 1 of the inverse tangent of t squared plus 2, uh, the square root of t squared plus 2, that is, sorry about that, divided by t squared plus 1 times the square root of t squared plus 2 dt, which is Ahmed's integral, and this is the case we were interested in. We were interested in i of 1, right? So this implies that that Horrifying integral i sub 1 simplifies out quite nicely to i of infinity minus i of 1. Now referring back to our equation, the left hand side by the fundamental theorem of calculus evaluates to i of infinity minus i of 1. And this equaled, this term here was pi squared by 16 minus uh, this integral i sub 1 which was i uh, of infinity um, and you have this two negatives giving you a positive i of 1. So i of infinity evaluated out to pi squared by 12, correct? Uh, okay, so you have two of them, and you have negative 2 times, sorry about that, you have negative 2 times i sub 1, and all of this equals pi squared by 16. Okay, cool. So this implies that twice of i equals 2 pi squared by 12 minus pi squared by 16, which evaluates to 5 pi squared by 48. So finally, all of this implies that i equals 5 pi squared by 96, which is quite a nice result for such a monstrous integral. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.